unbelievable that in the most famous city of the richest country in the world, they're digging mass graves. You have death rates now, they are going to go up. Those numbers are going to go up. The closer people get to one another, the more deaths we're going to see. It was saying it would be 60 something, it's already past that. Uh, the president now says 80,000 or 90,000, maybe 100,000. More Americans are going to soon be dead. Death projections. Death projections. Death projections. Death projections. Death in the new media age groans under the weight of simulation. Our world is one in which models supplant reality. At the moment, we are in the midst of a death crisis, as well as a crisis of death and its meaning. Over this video and the next one, I'm going to draw a contrast. Being towards death and death by simulation. <laughs> Double entendre. The first gives a meaning to death, while the second represents death stripped of meaning. It's not permitted to mean anything. Unsurprisingly, the TV models death after this version. Now what could death mean? Rewind to 1927 and the publication of one of the best philosophical books ever written, Being and Time. Its author, Martin Heidegger, is likely the most important philosopher of the last century, and though I don't think you'll be able to argue me out of that position in a YouTube comment, I'd certainly like to hear whether you have an alternate theory. As far as I'm concerned, he's pretty much a bottleneck of the history of philosophy as his interpretation of what came before really defined the tone of what came after in the schools of phenomenology, hermeneutics, existentialism, and literary theory, all of which came to dominate philosophy in the latter half of the 20th century. Now, it's required by convention to follow up any mention of Heidegger by reminding you that he was a Nazi, or would be six or seven years after the publication of this book. He seemed to do his best to ingratiate himself to the party between 33 and 34, and then sort of distance himself, though his remorse was not enough to satisfy everybody. The real question here is whether his philosophy is inherently nationalist, fascist, or racist. For me, the evidence provided for that connection is pretty tenuous. And moreover, what's odd is that some of his most repeated emphases are diametrically opposed to the fanatical mobs and hyper-technocratic bureaucracies of Nazism. But there are also some who believe his politics and philosophy are more complementary. And while I disagree with that, there is evidence that supports both positions. Even his friends and students were split on this question during denazification. So I'm not trying to sweep all that under the rug. It's rather uncomfortable that someone who instills in readers the value of thought and reflection would lapse in both so colossally. I wanted to just offer this for your consideration. I'll link to a Wikipedia article that outlines the testimony from people who actually knew him. Being in Time is an analytic in which Heidegger develops a phenomenological hermeneutic of how we, as living beings, exist and experience the world. Death is one of its main emphases. Death has almost always been made meaningful in religious contexts. I chose Heidegger here because, though he is sort of implicitly theological, he analyzes death without recourse to mortality as an opposite of immortality. For Heidegger, your awareness of your death is what colors the whole rest of your life with meaning. Here's a regular picture of how we might conceive of the concept of death. Medical death. We are born, your life is what you do for a while, and then death is the end of that life. Not so for Heidegger. From the moment we're conscious in our particular human mode of consciousness, which is both embodied and linguistic, we are aware of time. And with every moment that passes, we are aware that our death is approaching us from the future. You're always experiencing your death somewhere in the back of your mind, in that you know it's coming. So your death is not just something at the end of life, it's beside you all along, like a shadow. Now, if you know anything about Heidegger, you'll know that I probably shouldn't be using the word consciousness. The word consciousness is too often associated with an overtly mental or subjectivist version of mind. Heidegger asks you to consider yourself as something that is there in a world that is there alongside you. His word for this is Dasein. 
Consciously being there and being aware that you're there develops in you through a whole bunch of shifting feelings and moods towards the world. And the most important is that you're temporal, that you're mortal, you're in time. So you can sort of get the title now, your being, being there, in time, done, being in time. Just in case there are pedants among you, the being mentioned in the title is not your individualized expression of being, but being in general. But for now, let's just focus on the experience of death plus temporality. According to Heidegger, when design, we'll just say you, when you reflect on the world, it doesn't feel like that world was made for just you. There's an uncanny feeling that you are not its center, that other processes and people have their own thing going on despite you being there. The mountains did not rise for you. The forests were not planted for you. This experience gives Dasein one of its original dispositions towards the world. Thrownness, Geworfenheit, because it feels like you were thrown into something that was already in progress. Sure, you can do mental experiments, some of which you've probably heard of. Maybe the whole world is just the conjuring of a devil. Cogito ergo sum. However, you can only ask these kinds of questions because you've already spent all of your life up till that point interacting with the world from a sense of thrownness. You're a part of something and you have a feeling that it started before you, is somewhat ambivalent towards you, and in all likelihood will go on without you. You are something that gets dragged along in thrownness, that is to say, as something which has been thrown into the world. You exist as an entity which has to be as it is and as it can be. Now, look at this quote, it's significant because it shows two dispositions towards temporality. Thrownness is one of these, that feeling that the world has its own time outside of your experience of time. Yet we also look to the future. This is called projection. In English, the word project etymologically means to throw forward. When you consider the future, you undertake projects. That is, you consider your possibilities of action. Now, of all the things you do, there is only one that you must do, and that is die. Any possible action you take, then, in time, is one step closer to death, no matter what that action is. You're aware of this, and it actually changes the shape of all experience. Your death is not just this thing in the future, it's with you now, and you're aware that every action brings it closer. This gives your actions value, because you have to choose which one is most worth doing, considering that anything that you do brings your death one step closer. This is called being towards death, which Heidegger pretty much ripped off of Kierkegaard and that's why it's sometimes lumped in with existentialism. Death is the possibility of the impossibility of any existence at all. It is the possibility of the impossibility of every way of comporting oneself towards anything. Because you're going to die, and yet will never experience death because you can't be there when you're not there, you have another existential disposition towards your life world, and this is called care. This is an original way of being, meaning that you are open to the world, that you'll take an interest in it. You question the world that you find yourself in, you're curious about it, you care about your time here, because every time you do something, you're drawing nearer to not being here. So time is where your life gets its meaning from. Your projects matter because each one is a step towards death. Actually, hold up here. So I started with the second half of being in time, the part about time. But the first half, which is about Dasein, explores our original ways of encountering the world. And this is called ready to hand. This inner circle shows some of Dasein's original dispositions of care. And this outside circle shows how these dispositions are best expressed, according to Heidegger. You are not at your most human when you are watching YouTube. You are at your most human when putting your hands on the world. Now, not just in an instrumental sense, not doing it as a job. Heidegger wouldn't even use a typewriter because he thought it would lead to bad philosophy. So he wrote all this out by hand, or so the story goes. Anyway, if you want to be more human, go explore the Hanlekite or manipulability of the world. 
You can see in here the German word hand and in here the Latin word hand. You got to use your hands directly on the world if you want to know it and really understand it. We call these hobbies as if they're frivolous, but for Heidegger, this is when you're at your most authentic. I'm not into giving advice, but maybe this frictionless abstract space of YouTube isn't where you want to spend all your dying time, except this channel, of course. All right, back to dying. Your concern with projects, taking action and making a difference matter because your death is always inching towards you. As a mortal, your time is limited, so you have to choose what to spend your time on. This is your freedom. The horizon of death is what makes these things worth doing. Now I've discussed thrownness and projection, two ways Dasein cares. The last mode of care is where you get your sense of your own unfreedom, which is caused by everybody else. You fall in line, you fall into a crowd, absorbed by politics, TV shows, career expectations, consumption, idle gossip. Instead of being yourself, doing your own projects, you become an aspect of they self. It's not a simple case of whether these things are good or bad, just that the activity that made you you has now been absorbed by the world. The word for this is verfallen, fallenness, because you have fallen out of yourself and into a crowd. The crowd is just they. They don't wonder and they don't act out their freedom as individuals. Doing what everyone does because everyone does it is the opposite of acting out your freedom. And it is an inauthentic way to live. You get sucked into average everydayness. And that world is not as interesting. It no longer provokes your curiosity. This is just repeating habits and following trends. Authentic living is being aware of death, dreading it, sure, but then acting out the freedom that it offers. And the feeling of fallenness is that which pulls you out of everydayness and back to authenticity. Authentic being towards death is an impassioned freedom towards death. A freedom which has been released from the illusions of the they, and which is factical and certain of itself. This they is called Das Mann, the inauthentic Das Sein. So what was this video about? I tried to present the case that death is not only meaningful, but it's the horizon of all meaning. The way death is considered today is comparatively inauthentic and stripped of meaning. In fact, it's prohibited from meaning anything. It's a mere opposition to health. The meaningless death of crowds, the spectacle of death plastered across our screens offer little chance for meaningful reflection, not just on why death matters, but conversely, how death gives life meaning. You're on Plastic Pills. This has been part one of two, Tracing Death's Disenchantment. And as always, I appreciate uh, knowing what you thought of it. Actually, one of you, a commenter, left me this death as a topic. So thanks for that. And stay tuned for part two. Till then, memento mori. <laughs>